Sleepy Sheepy here. Today we're going to be looking at a really exciting build that I feel like unlocked some knowledge and understanding about how to create a build that I had previously not really appreciated. So for about a year and a quarter I'd been laboring under the delusion that this was Dark Souls 3 and that I was Chase the Bro, but it turns out I'm not and this isn't. So we'll take a closer look at kind of how this build functions and why it, you know, really fits Elden Ring in a way that some of my previous builds haven't. So before we jump into the build for this video, I just want to preface this with saying that this is going to be a little bit longer than usual. I kind of have a lot of things that I want to talk about, so if you want to skip ahead to the invasions, definitely feel free. One major way that Elden Ring is different than Dark Souls 3 is that in Dark Souls 3 you could really get away with creating a build focused around one single weapon and using that to its full potential. And while Elden Ring does have really well-rounded weapons, just the playstyle, especially in invasions, is such that you can't really focus on one weapon and make it work in all situations. You're going to be playing players that have, you know, either a ton of FP and are super passive and can just kind of chip you from far away. So if you have a weapon that's not amazing at aggressing, then it's going to be problematic for you. And similarly, if you have a weapon that doesn't do well in a defensive setup and you have really aggressive players, then, you know, you're going to suffer and die. So this is really meant to be a build that covers all your bases and has kind of an answer for everything, which is really necessary in Elden Ring. And while, you know, I think we can appreciate that as a, a player in most situations, I, I think just sticking to only one weapon can be really detrimental. So let's take a look at how this build kind of covers your bases. First of all, you're going to have the Arumi in your main hand, and you'll also have an offhand CGS. This setup is incredibly powerful because you can go for the fully charged attack, and if your opponent tries to attack out of hit stun, they're going to get punished by the CGS in your offhand. And we're also boosting the fully charged attacks with the Axe Talisman, which is going to be a great choice for this fully charged R2, which has great range and a fantastic hitbox. But you can also switch to the two handed move set of your CGS, and in this case, I'm going to be using the Omen Cleaver, which has another fantastic fully charged R2. This gets a ton of hyper armor, and the fact that we can buff it with Lightning Slash means that we can do like 1200 damage with just this single fully charged R2, and we can trade into attacks that would normally poise break us. So that's going to be kind of the first element of just the, the talisman setup, as well as the approach with the CGS and the offhand and a main hand Arumi. So these two weapons together, I feel like cover you know, approaching situations from neutral as well as defensive situations. Because if you're backing up, you can oftentimes do a turn and burn with a fully charged R2. You can also land jumping light attacks. Um, a common approach is to kind of fade backwards while doing that jumping light attack, and that can be a nice way to stun your opponent, especially because the hit is going to deliver over 100 poise damage, which is often going to, you know, poise break most opponents. And then also you just have a very nice, wide sweeping turn and burn with the CGS. So both these weapons together are going to be a great way to kind of defend yourself if you're on the back foot. And just the range of the Arumi, especially with something like the crouch attack, is going to allow you to approach neutral in a really aggressive way, bait your opponent towards you, and then as they get close, you can hit them with the CGS, which is going to do much more damage than the Arumi would, and come out in a poise breaking way that is just very solid for uh, the aggression that you're trying to bait with that kind of attack from neutral. Next, I want to talk about answering our offensive and kind of oppressive questions. So that's going to be a swap over to the Thrusting Sword, which I really enjoy with an offhand CGS because you still have access to the wide sweeping attack that comes out relatively quickly, but you do have these very fast and very long range attacks that also can be free aimed. So it's worth noting that the tracking on the running heavy is not amazing if you're locked on, but you know, if you anticipate your opponent trying to strafe you, so you can kind of adjust your, your free aim there at the last second to be a little bit more to the left or to the right, assuming that they're going to strafe to the left or the right, and you'll oftentimes connect. Also, the jumping attack is going to have four frames in the air, which is going to be amazing. So four active frames for your hitbox means that you can deliver some very nice jumping unlocked attacks, and your sword gets a hitbox all the way down and kind of delivers a, a sweeping attack, even though 
though it looks like a poke. So those are going to be really useful elements. I do recommend swapping over to the Spear Talisman and potentially the Claw Talisman if you're going to be running the Heavy Thrusting Sword, but having this as an option as along with the Arumi and the CGS means that you really are going to be able to be very aggressive with your uh, HTS, you know, still defend yourself in neutral, and then if you're playing a little bit more defensively or just want to bait people into attacks from neutral, then you're going to have the Arumi, which I find to be still a very strong option. So looking at the build a little bit more closely, just from a stat perspective, we'll be running this at 125 with 54 dexterity. We can bump that up to 59 with Millicent's Prosthesis, as well as the Axe Talisman is gonna be a great choice for the Arumi and the Omen Cleaver. We'll also have an offhand Miser Accord. Since we're running a whip in our main hand, we won't be able to deliver crits. So it can be really nice to roll, switch over to the Miser Accord, and then you know maybe go for a roll type backstab or something. Or if we get a guard break with you know something like the fully charged heavy we can just do a swap sw uh, soft swap and grab that repost so that's going to be a pretty good option to have on hand and it's going to be more practical than hard swapping we're also going to be running 101 poise which is going to be great since we'll be able to poise tank the flaming strike as well as storm stomp which can be an absolute menace in the arena and we'll be running the omen spark mask which does give you an extra two points in strength so that brings us up to 20 strength and allows us to put just a little bit more points into dexterity and endurance which is going to be necessary since we are running an offhand weapon that's a little bit heavy and we want to be able to swap over to something like a great bow without unequipping some of our other items we'll be running the bull goat talisman as well as the great jars arsenal since we want to hit that poise of 101 and then as for our physic i've been running the opaline hard tier as well as the crimson bubble tier i've started to become an opaline hard tier and Enjoyer over some of the more offensive hard tiers or just tiers in general. So something like a strength knot or a dexterity knot. I just find that being able to negate some of your incoming damage is going to be extremely useful in you know the first three minutes of an invasion. So I, I think it makes sense to do that, especially when you do have some very high damaging options already available to you. That pretty much covers everything that I wanted to say about the build and the strategy we're going to be employing. If you have any questions, definitely let me know in the comments below. And if you wouldn't mind considering subscribing, I'd definitely appreciate it. Let's go ahead and and jump into the invasions as well as the arena content. All right, so jumping into our first invasion, we're gonna have a 3v1. And here we can kind of understand the utilization of the neutral and defensive elements of this build. So first we're gonna go ahead and buff our weapon. We we're hoping to land the lightning slash, but it is a fairly difficult weapon art to land. So it, we're gonna take some damage in the process. We're gonna try not to get bled, but here we can see the, the whip is gonna be a great way to roll catch our opponent that's at quite a distance from us. So utilizing that extra range and the extra damage that we get with the CGS means that these two weapons are gonna have really good synergy. So here we have uh, another player coming in and this is kind of a one player comes in after the other. So it's a really nice kind of style of invasion. Here we can see how much damage the fully charged R2 is gonna deliver when it is buffed and we are are using the axe talisman and even though we had a very bad connection with that player we we're still able to come out on top so here we land uh, just a couple heavy attacks with the whip and deliver one more chip damage followed up by a light attack with the cgs and those hits together are going to be enough to come out with the w against uh players you know with very little effort and in all those cases those players were running uh fairly aggressive play styles, which meant that we could approach neutral very easily and pretty successfully and really play that neutral and defensive game with uh, relative ease. So moving on, we have another invasion and this one was basically psychological warfare on the host. We were going to attempt to ignore them for as long as possible and continue just kind of eviscerating their friends with our setup. So. We aren't focusing on the host at all. We're gonna, you know, damage them here or there, but really the name of the game is to take care of anybody that comes into this world that isn't the host and just kind of see what happens over time. So we're seeing some uh, pretty aggressive play styles from the, the host. They're coming in hot and heavy with the L1 with the dual katana setup. And we also are trying to avoid the incoming damage of Moonveil from the back. And this is gonna be a, a little bit difficult of a play style when we have a fairly passive, Phantom, as well as a very aggressive host. I feel like they've caught on to kind of the 
pressure that I'm trying to apply, which is mostly to the Phantom and not at all to the host. But here we do get a jumping heavy attack that is going to poise break our Phantom here, and we can kind of get them on the back foot. So it wouldn't have been a bad option to switch over to the HTS in this scenario, but the whip is still going to be good enough to pressure with you know the incoming blue and the kind of pressure from behind from the host. So as this new blue comes in, you know they're wearing the Radon helm, so we can expect a certain level of skill that they're going to you know bring to this particular fight and they do bring out crozier's hammer really just chase us around with it for a little while laying down a you know potentially dangerous track of fire behind them so we need to kind of back off and just adjust our playstyle a little bit here we were hoping to use the trees as a potential way to kind of bait our opponents into a spot where they would get hit by lightning slash lightning slash is kind of hard to deliver and here we go for the fully charged r2 and do quite a bit of damage and we've switched to the two-handed moveset for the CGS, and that's going to be a great option for delivering a ton of damage very quickly. And just kind of being versatile enough to know that the fully charged heavy is going to be doing a lot of damage and quickly take care of that blue right as in time as another blue comes in. So here we can do the soft swap over to the Misa Record, and while the opponent with the dual anchors is in their recovery frames, we get that backstab and then begin the chase down with the whip and the jumping heavy attack followed up by a CGS light attack is going to be enough to take care of that player. So at this point, the mind games that we've been employing on the host have worked out. They completely give up and jump off a cliff and we just kind of applaud their efforts. So uh, a nice moment there. Moving on to our next invasion, this group of three is going to be trying to answer the age-old question of how many moon veils is too many moon veils. And, you know, I'm not sure we're going to learn the answer, but they're absolutely going to try and, and work on the philosophy behind a question like that. So we see pretty much every player running uh, not too much bigger, which is uh, the fairly standard play style you get with moon veil players. And here we just get every single moon veil attack available until people are out of FP. So uh, that moment right there kind of cracked me up. And I wouldn't say this was like technically the most correct invasion I've ever performed. Um, it was a little bit hard to keep track of all the incoming projectiles and get the roll timing down, uh, along with kind of the quick swings that you see from katanas. So you will see gradual chip damage, but I'm absolutely doing my best in this situation and utilizing kind of the potential to stun multiple opponents at the same time with something like the fully charged R2, and then using some either ranged attacks or hyper armor attacks like Beast Roar, where we can just do a quick turn and turn with Beast Roar and at least take care of the blue. We also have a weird moment here uh, coming up where the gravity attack comes in. It doesn't, oh, it does hit us for damage, but uh, not too much damage. I'm used to a lot more damage and it does pull us into an attack. So um, that's gonna be something that's a, a little bit scary. The gravity attack can be quite the nuisance. It's a little bit difficult to roll and you kind of need to delay your roll and I recommend rolling forward through it rather than try to roll from behind because all the projectiles uh, take up quite a lot of space so even if you just get hit by one it's kind of going to be a chain reaction where you start getting hit by another since they do have some poise damage. So we are in a little bit of a better situation here where you know it's only a 2v1 now the moon veil from the phantom has all but stopped and they do go for one final moon veil and they get hit with beast roar in a nice trade so we go for a hard swap over to a parry shield um at this point the number of moon veil attacks has kind of baited us into uh parry fishing but at a certain point it is worth it to recognize if you're not going to catch the fish so we are going to back off a little bit skip ahead after uh, maybe a few whiffed pale uh parry attempts and you know, we'll go for one more since it's still in our offhand. Uh, go for a little bit of damage with the shield too, which is always a, a fun way to try and bait parries. And eventually, you know, we move on to the tried and true. We get the whip followed up by the beast roar, and then just a jumping heavy attack is going to provide us with a nice hitbox that carries over to the left side of our body and still manages to chip our opponent. So Next up, we have a uh, nice little fun party on the beach with a group of three. This is a very common space to kind of find groups of players looking to kill invaders. So uh, interesting moment, but we're going to have time to go for our buffs. So I definitely recommend, you know, some lightning grease on the Arumi as well as lightning slash on the offhand. That's going to really maximize your damage. I didn't go for it every time, but uh, if you have the time and the space and uh, you want to give it a try, absolutely go ahead and get your buffs going, especially in an environment like this where you don't know 
you know, you don't really have anywhere to run, and we are seeing some uh, Royal Knights Resolve coming in from the player. I kind of anticipated that they would go for a jumping attack, since that's very common with the Power Stance moveset for Halberds. So I went for Beast's Roar and just kind of knocked them out of the air. And that's also a nice way to just kind of get a gauge on how much HP they're running. Uh, that can be a fairly safe maneuver, just because you're going to have a lot of space. And if it does connect, even though it's not going to kill them, that little bit of chip damage is going to give you some pretty valuable information. So here we're going in for some running heavy attacks with the Arumi, which is going to poise break our opponent most of the time. And here we don't land the jumping heavy. The, the hitbox, I think, was in the correct spot, but I think they managed to roll it successfully, which definitely was unfortunate. So we need to back off a little bit and regroup. Um, we will also be having a bit of an issue here. We're going to try to swap to uh, something with Bloodhound steps since we are seeing all these projectiles coming in. But when we open our menu, we'll realize that we had actually recently restarted the game, which means that our menu is uh, not in kind of the right order. So we quickly, you know, switch back the order to the way we'd like it to be. Uh, also close those menus that I know everybody hates seeing in YouTube videos. And we're gonna be in a position to at least kind of get on our um, right footing when it comes to the weapons that we're swapping to. So here we're able to hit them with a, a heavy and then a fully charged heavy with a CGS attack in between. And those attacks together really were enough burst damage to, to take care of that phantom very, very quickly. They went from full HP to none uh, in just a matter of hits. And, and that's really why I do like this setup as a fairly defensive setup as well as a attack from neutral. And then here we do have that extra range of beast tour. You know, we waited until a really opportune moment in the fight to, to use it other than the initial use in the beginning. It gave our opponents enough time to kind of forget that it may be an element at play. And that can be a very useful tactic to just kind of, you know, use your weapon arts a, a little bit sparingly or, <laughs> you know, save that L2 button for the opportune moment. Um, here, going for Beast Roar with a uh, Estus Punish, I think is absolutely the right play. They know that it's out and about now. And here this player is light rolling. So if they're gonna trade, I'm gonna kind of show off my true colors as a monkey masher and just kind of attack out of hit stun repeatedly. But I can kind of calculating in between each hit whether or not I think that my damage is doing a high, high enough percentage of their HP where you know it makes sense for me to continue to press that l1 button over and over again and i think in that moment my calculations were correct and really you do want to be adjusting in between each hit being like should i roll out here or is it going to be safe to attack out of hit stun so this next one we have a group of three that was kind of hiding around the corner and so we're going to go for kind of a in and out approach where we run in take care of one player back off reset a little bit and you know try to go after another phantom as we come in for the next one. So here we do manage to catch the roll with the running heavy, and that's gonna be a really nice attack for just kind of the amount of range that it delivers. And here we see the host going for a fully charged heavy with a flail. They're running maybe 14 vigor, so it's not too much of an issue. We land the last hit for actually 14 HP. And uh, you know we can see how the whip went right through that kind of coffin in the middle of the area. And that's one reason the whip is really nice while invading is you have the opportunity to utilize kind of the hitbox, which is super weird and doesn't really, it, it kind of just ignores walls and stuff in, in a way that um, other weapons don't. So that's going to be one really nice element of the whip in the main hand and uh, one reason that I enjoy it in the kind of invasion setting. So this next invasion is going to be a group of three in Stormvale and they were definitely a, a pretty scary group. There was a lot of use of the L2 button with really high damage Ashes of War. Um, we have Estelle especially, it can take up so much space. Waves of Darkness takes up a lot of space. So I need to play fairly carefully and I'm mostly just trying to get some chip damage and bait them forward towards the PvE behind me. So that's kind of the, the main approach here, and then the PvE decides that it wants me involved in the fight, so it pushes me forward, and I do get hit by the player with the HTS, um, but it is providing kind of enough chaos, at least for a short period of time, where I'm able to get a little bit of chip damage off, but it's going to be kind of too little too late in this scenario, uh, just because the <laughs> approach the players are taking is going to be uh, very L2 heavy, and they're able to take care of that PvE extremely quickly. So here, I didn't realize that I was kind of running into a dead end, um, and I was hoping to get a turn and burn through this doorway, but that player had enough time and space to kind of back up and not get stuck in the Stormhawk Axe, so that was, you know, 
uh, a good play by the, the Phantom and meant that I kind of wasn't able to do what I wanted to do. And here I realized that if I stay in that room, I'm absolutely going to fail this invasion, so I need to find a way out. And this is kind of the scenario that I would absolutely prefer for Stormhawk Axe. I wait until they're all in that hallway so that they can't back up easily, and then I am able to finally uh, catch that player with the HDS and come out with the, the W at least against them and move forward into an area with some more PvE. And that's going to be extremely beneficial when you have players that aren't really, um, you know, afraid to deliver that L2 button um, over and over again. And, you know, you don't want to be trying to aggress them in a scenario like that where, you know, one person can just go for either Waves of Darkness or Wing of Estelle or, you know, the... Um, Stars of Ruin, just like it, it's going to be a, a much better situation if you can be out in the open and have the chaos of PvE. And I also am starting to realize that one, the poise damage on the Arumi is not going to be enough to poise break the player in full Bullgoat uh, most of the time. So if they're running over 100 poise, it makes more sense to switch my weapon a little bit. So here I do go to the two-handed move sent for the CGS, and I think that was probably the right play. And then I also switch over to the HTS, which is going to allow me to kind of get in and get out when they're going for something like the Wing of Estelle, Ash of War. And I don't get out super well in this scenario. I get hit by um, just kind of the, the Ash of War from behind. And in that moment, the PvE next to me died, which made it seem like I had also died just because of how low my HP was. And that was a great moment where I was able to actually get away. And there was a little bit of time there where we kind of reset to neutral, and then I ran back in with the Great Bow. And I was trying to get my Ash of War off on the, the Phantom because I really didn't have a great connection with them. I think uh, in some of the earlier moments with the HTS, you could just see the, um, the hit connecting, and then they would roll and no damage would kind of get delivered, which is, you know, very indicative of uh, a poor connection. So I was just trying to uh, approach things in a way where, you know, the hitbox would be a little bit more continuous. Something like Reign of Arrows is going to be a great option for that. So I try to land a, a running attack on the host there, but kind of the, the environment on the ground was prohibiting me from getting the full run forward. So I didn't have quite the same range that I might normally have, but I am able to start aggressing on the Phantom here, deliver one hit, and then here I get a terrible backstab attempt. Uh, definitely was kind of a bummer to see. They do roll the running attack very well, but here I do get a really nice unlocked jumping attack, and that can be extremely deadly. Your opponent might not roll thinking that you're not going to have kind of the right angle, and they'll be wrong since you'll be able to free aim. And then as I'm like really in a great position, to finish off the host, a red comes in and snipes me with <laughs> a bolt of Grand Sacks, completely missing the host, and then kind of steals my kill. So I didn't really love that moment, but um, you know, I guess they were trying to do their job, um, so I give them a wave anyway. Next up, we have a 2v1, and this one is going to be one where we just have a lot of projectile spam, and I'm not really in a place that I'd like to be. I do have a projectile of my own using Beast Roar, but between the Star Shower as well as um, Stormblade, it's just not, it's not a fun situation to be in a hallway. So I try to bait them forward, and I also switch over to the HTS to try to just aggress them a little bit more and, and improve my position within the space that I'm in. So here I've switched over to the area near the elevator shaft, and this is going to be much, much better for me because I can use kind of the pillars to dodge the incoming projectile. So we'll see as the, the host tries to hit me with Star Shower, it, it's mostly just going into these pillars, and I'm able to navigate around this space in a, in a more circular fashion rather than kind of just the long hallway where all the projectiles have nowhere to go but me. So I'm able to get a little bit of time with the Phantom here and get them to very low health, and they continue to aggress, which is pretty bold. I do go for some attacks out of hit stun. I think my timing with the HTS is still a little bit unfamiliar. I'm not sure when I can kind of take priority, but in, in that moment, I, I wasn't able to take priority out of the hands of the uh, greatsword. So I do need to back off a little bit and then finally deliver the blow against that player. And here I switch to just a regular thrusting sword. And this is one of my favorite moments coming up right here. I go for a little 360 for absolutely no reason in particular. They grab a very late backstab and we're both kind of just surprised and they're also poisoned. So we're just kind of looking at each other and uh, acknowledging kind of the weirdness of that moment. They take a couple steps to just demonstrate that they are still playing. They haven't disconnected and then they just die from the poison. So that was a, a moment that I really enjoyed. Um, 
Next up, we have another invasion in a very similar space. However, we do have access to the door behind us, which is going to mean that we can run further in through the level a little bit. And this is going to be a great opportunity to use the Stormhawk Axe. Here, I probably should have gotten a little bit closer to the door and maybe waited a little bit longer. Uh, the application of the Stormhawk Axe in that moment was not really perfect, and had there been uh, a better approach from the Phantom behind me, I could have gotten knocked out by, you know, any sort of ranged attack or like an Ash of War. Taker's Flame would have been something that I definitely could have gotten hit by, but it was enough to take care of one Phantom. And then as we kind of back off, we do see some incoming spells from the other Phantom. The host is just out of range, but we're able to kind of continue some pressure here, back off as new kind of spells come in, but we do have kind of that wall to hide behind, which is going to be very clutch. And here the fully charged R2 from the Arumi is going to be great, and then we can just follow it up with some CGS attacks, which are going to take up pretty much the entire space. And here at this point, we're seeing the host just kind of tactically bail on their friends and run through the fog wall. So uh, a nice moment there. Also, if you are noticing that my character is kind of like glitching to the side when I run, I was suffering from pretty bad stick drift through a lot of this invasion showcase. So. Uh, that's kind of what's going on. I did get a new controller, so it's not an issue anymore, but uh, it's not like me hacking the game or anything. It's just that my controller wants to pull me over to the left side of the screen, and I'm fighting it along the way. So this next invasion, we're going to be seeing a overleveled phantom coming into the world, and they've got a really big, slow weapon especially with a long Ash of War. So we can kind of punish that with a Sleep Pot. And here we just see how much damage we're able to deliver. So 800 some with the fully charged R2, followed up by a couple swings with the offhand CGS. And we're able to melt that player's HP bar, even though they had over 2200 HP. So we just kind of give them the point up as we acknowledge that they had a vastly overleveled Phantom and move on to our next invasion. So this is going to be a little bit of a weird one. We have a player that is probably running one or two sore seals the player in the godskin robes and we'll hit them with beast roar in just a moment here and that's going to do over 700 damage and most of their hp so kind of a, a fascinating moment just uh in terms of build creation coming from this phantom so we back off a little bit here and they go for some madness attacks so we go for beast roar and there's that 745 with the beast roar uh that does most of their hp and here they don't heal and get hit with the whip through the wall which is very clutch in a moment like that the wide sweeping attack that does go through solid objects is going to be amazing and we do need to back off as the other phantom has come into the world they're using some wide aoe attacks and we just need to be kind of cautious of that we can try to punish the use of moog spear with beast roar it's going to be a, a great option to deliver some additional chip damage and here we can understand that they're really playing the like behind the wall game so what we want to do is wait for a good time and just come in and deliver as much damage as possible uh, we get a nice kind of miyazaki shuffle moment here where the connection just kind of drops between me and that player. We get hit with the blood loss damage uh, about a minute later, so definitely a little bit scary, but we do get a really nice roll into weapon swap into backstab here with the offhand Misericord. So having that soft swap is instrumental. And our last moment from the invasion showcase, we're going to see just uh, a very interesting playstyle from this phantom here. They come down on the elevator, I send the elevator back up, and then they immediately roll down the elevator shaft. So that'll do it for the invasion portion of the showcase. All right, so moving on to the dual portion of the showcase, we're gonna be playing against a player that's showing off some really good skill with the wiggle tech, so I appreciate that. Um, definitely indicates a player that at least watches Stielowski, so probably a formidable foe. Uh, they do a good job of anticipating my jumping attack, which is usually used to punish the kind of running light attack that comes with the halberd, and then they punish my jumping attack a second time, this time with Giant's Flame take the and I assumed that they would charge it for a little bit longer, but they kept it to the short charge, which was absolutely the right play, and they're kind of on the right foot starting off. But we're able to land a running heavy and catch them out of the air, which does kind of shift the momentum a little bit in our direction, and we're a little bit closer to half health. And here we go for a fully charged R2. They take a second spin around and just like, what happened? Which is absolutely the right response to the amount of hyper armor and damage that comes with the fully charged R2. And we deliver just a really nice quick attack with the whip to finish them off off. Had it come out just a little bit later, we would have died. Moving on, we have a player that uses Black Flame Protection and buffs both their Power Stance Lances, so a uh, kind of scary setup here, especially when we're running something that's a little bit off meta, but we're going to see how well this does against a setup that is extremely strong. So 
What's nice is that we are wearing the Mushroom Crown, so even if we do get poisoned, we will get an AR boost. And we're just trying to space them appropriately and kind of punish them with a variety of attacks. Keeping them guessing is going to be extremely important. So here things don't go well. We get hit by a couple of the crouch attacks, which are very strong. And we do dodge the jumping attack, which probably would have killed us, but we're able to land a running heavy attack, deliver some extra damage, uh, heal the poison, and then... As they've swapped over to some regen as well as the lightning grease for the lance, we're going to be kind of running after them. Here they go for a self buff with poison and then use a ballast to heal it, but we're able to punish it with beast roar and then deliver just a couple hits with the CGS and we delay an attack and finally do come out on top. So uh, a scary opponent there with kind of the number of buffs they were running and just the power stance great spears, but we're able to, to come out on top in a pretty scary situation. Moving on, we have a player running an offhand CGS as well, which I definitely love to see. And they're also going to be hit by the lightning slash very early. So that's gonna be one of the best times to to deliver lightning slashes if your opponent jumps right next to you. Uh, it doesn't happen often, but we kind of got lucky there. And then here we're going to use the hyper armor of the fully charged heavy attack on the CGS to just kind of negate the incoming damage coming our way and deliver quite a lot of damage in the process and come out on top in that duel as well. So moving on, we have a player that calls themselves number one Scumlord, which is hilarious since they are running high poise build with power stance pikes, which are you know, very frustrating to play against for a lot of people. Um, not a personal enjoyer, especially when you have something like um, the Raptors Black Feathers, but here we are trying to just kind of get continuous reads on them, and here we are able to actually flawless them, which I was thrilled about, and we give them an honorable bow just to appreciate kind of the uh, the build they're running. And moving on, we have a player running the power stance great swords, which can be kind of scary, but here we can see just kind of potential vortexing that you'll be able to do with the combination of the Arumi and the CGS, mixing up your attacks, going for fully charged heavies when you think your opponent is going to go for a delayed attack, and then going for the CGS offhand attacks when you think your opponent is going to attack immediately. Uh, it does work out quite well, and you're able to really deliver a ton of damage extremely quickly. So here we see that again, where we're able to go from uh, full health to half health on our opponent extremely fast, and really it, they're fighting a super uphill battle. Um, we can play a little bit more passively, which is going to behoove us since we do have something like the Arumi, and we're going to be able to land a fully charged heavy followed up by a light attack as they try to fight for a priority. Uh, it's not going to be enough, and we'll come out with the W there as well. Moving on, we're going to have uh, another player here, and they're running a... Um, Ultra Great Sword, which is going to be a little bit scary. Uh, the hyper armor on that can be pretty substantial, but here we go for an unlocked turn as we realize our hit is not going to connect, and that kind of saves us from the crouch poke. But we're able to, again, mix up our attacks, really use all the poise breaking options we have to prevent them from getting that hyper armor that they would really like to get. If we hit them early enough, it's going to be enough to poise break them. They won't get the hyper armor and we were able to come out with another W. So I think we played this player earlier, but we're gonna be playing against a great sword again, this time with an offhand shield. Having an Arumi on your main hand is really annoying for somebody that is potentially looking to get a parry because they don't know if you're gonna be going for a CGS attack or a whip attack and only one of those two can get parried the whip cannot be parried. So I've seen people try to parry it, it will never work, uh, unfortunately. And here we are able to get the offhand CGS kill. And then lastly, we are going to have one more player just running a Duo Katana build, and they're going for uh, some jumping attacks right out of neutral, which is definitely the play style associated with Katanas. But we get a couple quick hits with the CGS, uh, one little bit of chip damage with the main hand whip, and then we're able to punish the piercing fang just in time and come out with the final w of the dual showcase as always if you made it this far i just wanted to say thank you so much for watching i really appreciate all your support and if you do have any questions or build recommendations definitely let me know that's all i've got and i hope you have a good one